terribly happy with what okay, he's doing. Okay, here we are. We're back with Mina Marita, Marco Mangelsdorf, and me, Mina, Marco, and me, on Monday uh, here on Think Tech, our, uh, our energy show that wake you up on a Monday morning. Wow, exciting. Uh, so, hi, Mina. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. I'm good. Good. And Marco, how about you? How are you? Ho, ho, ho. A very happy Monday to both of you. Ho, <laughs> ho. Thank you. So let's talk about uh, Richard Barreca's article entitled Senators Object to uh, Ron Kochi's Unilateral Action on the PUC. What, what's brewing in the legislature here with all this? Well, I, I, I think that the article may be a misrepresentation on how many senators may object. And um, I think the title was something like the senator made a unilateral decision. Yes. Um, you know, I, that might in itself be an exaggeration, but I can't speak for the Senate. But I think one thing that, um, you know, should be made clear that this is really a question of law. And it does affect the Senate's um, authority to confirm um, a nominee. And so it, it's a question that can only be resolved by the court. So I, I'm really happy that the Senate is participating with um, an amicus brief. Yes. Well, Mina, let me ask you, uh, this never happened uh, when you were the chair of the PUC. Um, the, the, the issue never came up in that, in that time anyway. Do you know if it ever no, has because, come up? Sorry, go ahead. No, because, because the appointments were proper. Every time that the um, Governor Abercrombie made um, a vacancy appointment, there really was a vacancy. That seat was empty because the previous uh, commissioner had resigned. In this case, um, the Constitution says that the sitting, the holdover commissioner, shall remain in place until his successor is appointed and qualified. And I think any reasonable person would look at appointed and qualified to mean, you know, confirmation, advice and consent by the Senate. So um, the state did file their statement of position, which was due on August 10th. And basically, they're just sticking to the argument that the governor has um, the authority to appoint uh, to fill a vacancy when the Senate is not in session. And I don't think anybody has a, a disagreement with that. The governor does have the authority to appoint um, to a vacancy when the Senate is not in session. But in this case, I don't believe a vacancy occurred when Commissioner Champley's term ended um, on June 30th because the law is clear that um, the incumbent commissioner remains as a holdover until his successor is appointed and qualified. And in the appointment process of the Constitution, the removal of a commissioner is prescribed by law, can be prescribed by law. And, and so in this case, you know, the law says the holdover commissioner doesn't get removed until his successor is appointed and qualified. Yeah, so I mean, your point is that the Senate has an interest in this because it wants to, um, it believes it may have authority uh, to consent or not consent before the successor takes office. Uh, has has right. uh, Commissioner you know, Champley expressed a view on this at all? No. Um, you know, as far as I know, and I think it's, it's stipulated in the argument that Commissioner Champley did not resign. Right. He had never resigned. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Marco, and where does this fit on the landscape of the PUC? You know, we knew that uh, Next Era was a traumatic experience for the PUC. It certainly took them away from their ordinary course of business for 18, 19 months. But uh, how does this affect the PUC going forward? 
Actually, what I'd like to do, uh, Jay and Mina, is kind of take a step back and put on my political science hat in looking at what's going on in the Senate in this matter. And I find it uh, rather interesting just to kind of give a little bit of background. So we have 25 total senators in, in Hawaii, state senators, and 24 of the 25 as of right now are Democrats, with the lone uh, Republican being good old Sam Slum from, um, I think it's Hawaii, Hawaii Kai area of, of Oahu. And it looks like he's under challenge now. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that come December 9th, the day after the election, general election, that the entire Hawaii State Senate, all 25 of them, could very well be in the Democratic hands, Democratic Party hands. But be that as it may, we have 24 Democrats and one Republican. And Ron Kochi is the, the president of the Senate. And he made the decision, apparently, to write an amicus brief uh, as part of uh, the lawsuit that Mina and Mark Bennett have brought on questioning, uh, challenging Gorak's uh, appointment or his, his right as uh, his legitimacy as, uh, as PUC commissioner. And uh, Richard Barreca's piece of a few days ago noted that there were four senators, including Donna Mercado Kim, who was the uh, the previous Senate president that was essentially deposed when Ron Kochi uh, was able to achieve a majority of the 24 Democrats, which uh, if you do the numbers, that's a minimum of 13 at least, 13 of his colleagues, well, including himself, so 12 of his colleagues, including himself, to be able to get a, a ruling majority and do... Uh, uh, become Senate president and also have uh, appoint committee chairs to the people who go with them. So I find it kind of interesting playing with the numbers that four, four apparent, uh, probably four of the senators on the losing side uh, decided to challenge Kochi essentially by questioning his, uh, his uh, apparent intervention in this lawsuit that Mina has brought. So, you know, to what extent uh, there's rumblings within the Senate uh, uh, to perhaps challenge Kochi. I mean, we won't know until after the election, but I just find it, uh, from a political perspective, interesting to note that, uh, you know, all is not peaches and cream and mangoes and, and lily koi in the Senate uh, amongst the Democrats in terms of, nor should it be necessarily, as far as how to proceed in this particular matter with four of them, at least publicly challenging Kochi's uh, intervention in, in this uh, lawsuit. So that's that's kind of, to me, the an interesting political question in terms of what's going on in the commission. Uh, I mean, as we've talked about before, so much so much is going on at the commission in terms of open dockets that uh, I, I hope very much that uh, now that they've been uh, re uh, supplied with the new oxygen, so to speak, after the next year decision was announced about a month or so ago, that they can move with alacrity to issue some decisions sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, I, I just want to go kind of touch on the political aspects of this. And this is where we get into trouble when we, you know, um, look, just kind of look at the political ramifications. In this, you know, I think the Senate president is moving forward because this really is a question of law and the um, a, a balance of power issue here. Um, you know, if this practice is allowed to stand, you know, it would be real easy for a governor to manipulate the, the um, nomination process to boards and commissions and to hold, to um, not put in a controversial um, candidate that might not gain Senate approval and wait until the Senate adjourns to put somebody in, and you know, if it's key decisions, they have like about nine months to possibly wreak havoc within a board or commission without that advice and consent from the Senate on that candidate. Mm. So you know, this, this could be a real abuse of power. So it goes beyond this one issue, but it really holds the, um, the executive's speak to the fire to make timely appointments that can be reviewed by the Senate um, so they, they can give their advice and consent to a um, prospective candidate for a board or commission. Yeah, I mean, it is and certainly you know, a balance of powers question. You have all 
all three uh, you know elements here you have the executive uh, made the appointment you have the uh, legislature um, you know who is concerned I guess the Senate is concerned about its authority uh, and query by the way what will happen uh, when this comes up for consent in in the regular session um, right uh, and, and finally you, you have know, the regulator uh, and and the, and the and the and the backdrop for all of this is that it had a profound effect on the decision of the PUC. The decision of the exactly. PUC would have gone the other way. A $4.3 billion deal would have gone the other way. So it's really important. It's not just technical. Yes, I, 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 you know, I, I agree with that. Even though it came down to a two, two to one vote without um, Gorak participating, uh, you know, from indications there appears to have been a majority um, decision to approve but apparently that majority decision was never written up uh, when when Commissioner Champley was um, seated and 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 so you know just but just putting next Sarah if you remove the politics away from it and and the uh, merger decision, you know, it really comes down to a question of law that needs to be reviewed by the court and interpreted by the court. Mm -hmm. Well, if I, if I could ask you a question, Mina, because you, of course, are much more uh, knowledgeable about ways of the legislature than I am, but do you believe that uh, Senator Ron Kochi, as president of the Senate, essentially was within his prerogative to do what he did without, say, convening the Democratic caucus there in the Senate to get discussion and whether this is something that there was a majority that wanted to do because apparently one or more senators have essentially said that they're uncomfortable uh, watching the Senate put forth a legal position that was never discussed and agreed upon. Well, I mean, I, you know, I can't speak for the Senate president and what did or did not occur amongst the members. But I, I think as the head of an institution like the Senate, that it would be concerned about the powers of, of that institution. And, um, and, and so again, you know, this, this would have ramifications way beyond um, his term in office. I mean, it's, it's an interpretation of the Constitution, of specific statutes, and the Senate's role in advice and consent. And, and so, um, you know, definitely what happened, um, the actions of the go governor contradicted prior attorney general opinions that have dated back for more than 40 years. It, um, contrary to well-settled principles in jurisprudence, you know, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but, you know, I don't think, I mean, you know, when you read it, it just on its face, it's sort of like something's wrong Well, here. it strikes me there must be plenty of law, uh, national law, on interim appointments and when they're good and when they're not good. Uh, and what happens yeah, if they I, are it, later it, undone? It, it, I, mean, I don't have an answer, but just suppose we go to January now, that the session comes up, that the administration promptly submits uh, uh, Tom uh, Gorak's uh, name for confirmation, um, and the Senate refuses to confirm. Uh, and a query whether they would be justified in doing that, whether it's um, you know, because they were ticked off about what happened uh, here in the summer, whether they can you know, refuse to confirm uh, in January, and if they do refuse to confirm, what happens to the decision? Um, it, it, it's, it's not that no, he voted no. on the decision; he really abstained on the decision. What happens to all okay. the other decisions between now and January? I mean, there's a million yeah, issues I mean, I think, coming up here. I, I think this is why this issue needs to be settled as soon as possible, and it looks like it's moving towards in the courts pretty quickly because we have a hearing scheduled on August 25th. But, um, you know, it, any decision that um, uh, Tom Gorak 
participates in any discussion he participates in as a commission commissioner is questionable at this time um, until he proves that he is legally entitled to that position. Uh, any any further thoughts on this, Marco? Otherwise, we'll move on to other subjects. Well, I was just going to ask Mina whether you know of any other amicus briefs, front of the court briefs that have been submitted uh, to date beyond uh, Ron Kochi's brief. Uh, do you know of any others uh, by other parties? Um, no, I don't. Well, I guess we'll, then, we'll know soon I, I enough, guess, right? A week from Thursday. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah I, we'll follow this. I hope, I, I hope well, we can you know, regroup it, shortly thereafter on uh, Mina, Marco, and me and uh, find out what happened, eh? Yeah, and I believe the court has to approve the filing of a, um, a, an amicus brief. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Well, they, mm -hmm. like, so they will state, I would think, as of uh, next Thursday, Thursday of next week, uh, who or which amicus briefs that they're willing to essentially give standing to, right? Yeah. yeah. I, think they, I think they already approved the Senate participation, but I haven't heard of any other participants. I wonder if Hawaiian Electric or the gas company would chime in. I, I would think that they wouldn't. I think that's that's too radioactive a subject for, for them to opine on. Yep, radioactive is the right yeah. word. Well, I, I don't want to take a break because uh, I want to move on to other subjects, but let me just say that we're here on uh, uh, Energy, uh, Mina Morita and uh, Marco Mangelsdorf and me for our Monday show on Energy. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go to another issue, and that is all the the events that have taken place around photovoltaic these days. Uh, one of the things uh, I gather from you, Marco, is that the photovoltaic uh, industry uh, continues to be in, in trouble on the mainland. Um, can you describe the trouble and can you give us a handle on how that might affect things in Hawaii? Well, in fact, uh, some of the data that I provided to the two of you in the past uh, day or two was actually focused on the two, uh, two of the markets here in Hawaii. Um, which are Oahu, which is the biggest market in the state, and the Big Island. They're the two counties of the four counties in Hawaii that I have the most visibility into in terms of publicly available uh, data as far as PV permits. And it's, uh, it's rather scary right now to be in this business uh, because the, uh, the numbers uh, for the first seven months of this year, January to July, are substantially down compared to the first seven months of, of last year. And what I mean by substantially is uh, roughly 50% fewer permits uh, here on the Big Island photovoltaic system permits first seven months of this year compared to the same period last year. And it's not quite as dire uh, yet on Oahu, but uh, last month the permit numbers for July of 2016 were down more than 50 percent, more than 50 percent compared to July of 2015. And I think it's quite possible that uh, by the end of the year, Oahu will be down uh, close to the 45, 50 percent uh, level as well. So uh, the takeaway is that there are fewer photovoltaic systems being permitted and therefore fewer photovoltaic systems being installed. And uh, that's, uh, that's, of course, a big concern uh, to, to me and my company and, and many others uh, in the same business uh, because we've, uh, you, know, you depend on a certain level of volume in terms of sale and revenue, sales and revenue in order to, uh, to make a go of things, profitability, and with uh, decreases of that nature, of that magnitude, it's, it's certainly a concern. So that's kind of one part of the um, piece of the puzzle. The other piece is that we are reaching uh, across the HECO territories, the HECO, HECO, MECO, reaching uh, the customer grid supply cap, respective caps, uh, which were established by the Public Utilities Commission back in October of last year. Uh, that cap was already reached to five megawatts uh, for MECO, for Maui County, about five or six weeks ago. We are within days, within days of reaching it here for Hawaii County, and Oahu will probably be a week or two or three uh, after we hit the cap. And the next step, uh, as outlined by the commission in their decision and order of October last year, would be that we'd move to uh, uh, what's known as customer self-supply, which is uh, an interconnect agreement 
where any export that were no exported solar power is essentially allowed to feed back into the grid, which uh, requires uh, battery storage, battery storage. And I've taken the rather deep dive as of late into what is available at what price for homeowners to have batteries as part of their PV systems. And uh, my, my conclusion at this point is that there, there are limited options uh, right now, and they are expensive options. So I'm very concerned that if we, the industry, and more importantly, homeowners who still want to go solar, who have not yet gone solar, that uh, under the customer self-supply option, it'll lead to uh, a further uh, dramatic, possibly, uh, probably, decline in adoption of of PV, which uh, I think everybody would agree is not what we want to see. Uh, collectively. The, I mean, the commission has been clear, uh, ECO has been clear, that they see the benefit of a lot more distributed uh, rooftop solar. Well, I don't understand one major point here, though. You say that you, you, if you have self-supply, you have to have um, batteries, but what about Correct. just buying power from uh, the utility? Why, why can't I have, I mean, isn't, doesn't the self-supply arrangement that they recently announced allow you to buy power? So you can have self-supply, um, except that you have to buy power during the evening. This, this is, you know, the entirely workable option, isn't it? Well, it's in theory, yes, Jay, but in practicality, the, the cost of a self-supply system when batteries are, are required, uh, the cost to the, uh, the homeowner with uh, any system with appreciable with appreciable battery storage is significantly dramatically higher compared to a battery less system so it, it's going to be a harder sell it's definitely going to be a harder sell definitely to, a harder sell but homeowner. you don't have to you don't have to have batteries to do self supply and that means you don't have to have batteries to have photovoltaic on your roof um, you can just you can use the photovoltaic during the day and at night you can buy electric like everybody else um, Which means right. two I, things. It, it's the, Go ahead. It's, you know. Isn't it just a matter of properly designing the system so that there is no export? Well, if you do, as, as, as Jay just suggested, Mina, that means that, that given the typical usage pattern for a Hawaii home, which is less during the day, more you know, when the sun goes down, that the PV system size, if you don't have batteries and it's customer self-supply, is going to be very small, incredibly manini, and is not going to provide much in terms of bill savings to to the homeowner. So yeah, we could install a hundred, you know, a, a 1.2 kW system that has no batteries that will not export much during the day, but uh, there's not going to be much of a big whoop factor to the homeowner in terms of bill savings. It's only going to take care of a small a small percentage of their overall power needs. Well, let me, let me ask right. this, though. I mean, you, you, you have a situation where, I guess, and the PUC is in on it, I mean, uh, where you, you, uh, you have a cap, and the cap is there for a good reason. The cap is there on the basis of existing technology. Um, but if, um, uh, if the technology changes, if the grid gets smarter, and hopefully it will soon, um, then the cap could come off. The cap could be modified. It's not a it's not a permanent limitation here. It's just that for now, um, you know, you you can't go beyond the cap. Uh, I I don't see this as the end of the world. Um, as, as the technology improves, we can have more photovoltaic. But even you know, even if it was the end of the world, um, you know, it's not the end of electrical power. It's not the end of renewables. It's just the end of the solar installation you know, the, the, the high time for the solar installation industry, right? That's what it is. Well, and, and I think, you know, it would be ludicrous for any of us to think that you could continue with um, exponential growth knowing that, you know, there's a finite capacity within the grid um, a, as we move forward. So it really becomes, really, really becomes customer choice now on how a customer would, proceed given the market yeah. things like the cost the cost of of um of uh bulk storage any kind of bulk storage well bulk storage and may get cheaper i mean right now I, my sense of it is the bulk storage are going 
bulk storage for a given residence is going to be almost as expensive uh, as the PV in the first place, um, even mm -hmm. though there are you know, good technologies coming on the market. And this, this creates a problem because the spreadsheets that the installers you know, sell on the basis of, you know, they won't look so good. Um, and, and, the, and furthermore, and I'm not sure about this, but you get the same tax credits for bulk storage equipment as you do for PV. If not, that makes it even harder. Well, my understanding is that the federal investment tax credit, the ITC, which is 30 percent, does cover the cost of storage. It does cover the cost of storage. Uh, there was an attempt uh, last legislative session to have a, a tax credit, a specific state tax credit, that would have been able to be applied towards uh, the purchase of, of storage uh, that would be partially offset by the state tax credit. That bill uh, did not get out of conference committee because of uh, disagreements between uh, the House Rep. Chris Lee, the chair of the, uh, the House Env Energy and Environment Committee, and his counterpart on the Senate side, Lorraine Inouye. So there was an attempt to carve out, essentially, or make for a specific tax credit for battery storage here that, that died, unfortunately, at the end of, of the, the session. But uh, the, the, to, to go back to, I think, something you mentioned, Jay, in terms of when the Commission established these CGS caps, the Customer Grid Supply Caps, no one can plausibly argue they did it. They came up with these numbers based on the capacity of the grid to accept more PV. They came up with 5 megawatts for Helco, 5 megawatts for HECO, or excuse me, 5 megawatts for MECO, 25 megawatts for, for HECO. These were not arrived at scientifically in terms of what the grid can handle. They were somewhat arbitrary, and they, they were what the, the numbers they came up with for so-called phase one, phase one. So we are waiting very eagerly for the commission to issue some type of decision and order on the DER docket, distributed energy resources docket, which will either be, I think, narrowly tailored to perhaps address the CGS issue because they have been lobbied uh, directly by the, the, the industry, the PV industry, to increase the caps, or I expect a more kind of global and comprehensive DER decision and order, which will also cover CGS, uh, time of use metering, and other matters. So I can only say that I hope, I really hope that something is forthcoming soon because there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty. And yes, I mean, I certainly have a narrow selfish interest based on my company and based on our industry. But more importantly, for consumers, what we have available now, what we can offer right now under customer self-supply, the options are limited and it's very expensive. Yeah. And that doesn't seem to me what we want to see. Well, you know, we're going to talk about but, this but tomorrow I, in know, Hawaii there's, Clean there's, Energy there's Day no. uh, at the Laniakea, which begins at 9 o'clock in the morning and runs all day. And one of the panels uh, chaired uh, by John Cole, former PUC commissioner, now with HNEI and others, um, is, is going to be about storage. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, uh, come down or check it out on our live stream. We're going to live stream the program, too. Mina, you wanted to say something? Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that we're not looking at here is, is the impact on the customers that do not have access to rooftop systems. And, and so, you know, while technically um, there might be some room for um, greater capacity on the grid for PV, you know, I, I have to assume that one of the things that the Commission also looked at was the um, subsidization of PV by the non-PV customer. You know, and that's something that doesn't get mentioned very often and um, that needs to be considered. It's the, the, um, the, the cross-subsidization -subs and not only by... Um, the rate payer, non-PV rate payer, but also by the taxpayer. So, you know, if you're looking at energy storage and having a similar tax, um, tax credit for energy storage, you're talking about the same people that benefit from rooftop PV getting the same benefit again. And what about the 75% of other um, customers that just you know, physically or uh, financially um, do not have access to, to these kinds of systems. Yeah, so there are so, right many, now, so many issues and considerations, and it's 
changing so much in the, the, the way the parties react between the legislature and the, and the PUC and the executive, it's all changing. I would not have expected these, uh, you know, these fine uh, technical decisions to be made by the PUC. I think in the past, a lot of them were made simply by the utility. So, I mean, we got everybody in the mix now and more issues every time. And that's why this show is so useful and valuable. But unfortunately, we're out of time. We're going to have to come back to continue our discussion two weeks hence. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Marco. I love you guys thank both. You. I love you both. <laughs> Mahalo.